let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually say around. Right. This is much. so we awesome. We are an open culture that it is actually in an open source. It's that process yeah. that a developer, or let's say, as the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask an OpenShift Admin Office Hours live stream. I am co-host Andrew Sullivan, joined almost as always uh, by Mr. Johnny Ricard. How are you today, sir? I'm good, man. How are you? Uh, you know, it's it's another beautiful day. I'm still vertical, so I can't complain. Always a plus, man. Always a plus. Yeah, you know, what, what, uh, every, every day is a holiday, every paycheck a fortune, every meal a feast, and every formation a parade. So, you know. The ultimate optimist. Yeah, you know, uh, always got to be, always got to be. A, I'm a half full kind of guy myself, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, happy, uh, uh, what is this? This is the last week or the last uh, stream of February, I think. Um, time's flying. How are we already, yeah. like, in basically in March? It's crazy to me. Yeah, it's, as you get older, I feel like the clock just goes a little bit faster, you know, like every day is just a little bit shorter. Yeah. Yeah, you know, something, something, kids getting old, all that other nonsense. Yeah, something, something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I know, I don't, I don't know how much, uh, how many of our Red Hat folks will be joining us today. I think there's a, uh, a company meeting or some kind of thing going on internal. You know, it's all the normal stuff. It just so happened mm -hmm. to overlap with our stream today. So uh, for any folks who are watching us live, please don't hesitate to ask any questions that come to your mind as you're watching us. Uh, you know, today we're going to go through a couple of different things. Johnny's going to show off the security profile operator. I'm going to be showing off CoreOS layering. Uh, we're going to walk through a couple of demos and look at a bunch of different stuff. So, you know, ask, ask questions. Anything that comes to mind, anything that you want to know about, we'll do our best to answer those. If we don't know the answer, then we'll do our best to find the answers. Uh, but if you're not watching us live, if you're listening to us, you know, maybe uh, like a podcast on your drive into work or something, or uh, just catching up whenever you have time, you're also welcome to send us messages anytime. Uh, so we're pretty easy to get a hold of as soon as I find the right button inside of here. Uh, so you can reach me at andrew.sullivan at redhat.com uh, or at practical andrew across all the various social medias or Johnny, uh, Johnny at redhat.com, J-O-N-N-Y at redhat.com, or jrocktx1. Uh, so it's uh, today's topic is one that it, we, it is one of our What's New in OpenShift 4.12 series of streams. And it's uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff that we want to cover with this, um, and this being for OpenShift 4.12. Um, and we just kind of selected two of the things at random. Um, I'll say, I'll... I'll, I'll uh, admit to the fact that it was largely because what was it monday afternoon we're like oh crap what are we gonna what are we gonna stream about this week and yes. we both looked at the list and we're like yeah these two seem reasonable we can uh we can get something prepped by wednesday morning uh so that uh that's part of the reason why these two got selected but also at least for me personally uh core os layering is something that i've been watching for a while uh and something that is you know pretty it, it's interesting to me it brings back a tinge of the old uh administration style which yeah it might be good or might be bad right Hell yeah, I'm excited about it. Like that one, I was looking forward to when they announced it, uh, you know, on the roadmap. So I'm, I'm glad it's finally here. Yeah, I think uh, they, we we've talked about it in passing before. I want to say when um, Mark Russell was on the stream, uh, I want to say we talked about CoreOS laying. We might have even shown some pieces. I honestly don't remember. You know, we're what, what is this? Ninety four. We're, we're ninety four episodes in. There's been a. I know. We've talked about a bunch of stuff. We're getting up there. <laughs> I know it's uh I know it won't be long we'll be crossing episode 100 and you know it's uh it's, it's like we're official or something I don't know I know I know we're gonna have to go Instagram official one day you know like oh I'm so bad at social media don't give me something else to do <laughs> like I, I I still have a little I have a sticky down here at the bottom of my monitor that reminds me of like all the social stuff that we're supposed to do and I think on a on a good day I might hit half of these things so oh yeah adding oh, my God. adding more is not gonna go well crazy yeah. <laughs> But, uh, so yeah, so feel free, ask questions, send us chats, all of that other stuff. Uh, I'm starting to wonder. Yeah. So chat's kind of quiet today. Um, that's okay. Like I said, I think, uh, a number of red hat folks won't be joining us as a result of other things going on. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out, um, through the various things. Um, let's talk about top of mind topics, Johnny. 
Uh, let's see. I added in a couple of things on our sheet here, and I think you had a couple of th things as well. Uh, let's see. Do I have a window yet? Let me share my window here. Uh, and I'm going to share a window because... Uh, so last week, uh, yeah, nine days ago, so last week-ish, uh, we published a blog post that came out um, not long after uh, the 4.12 went GA. And we talked about this, or, or the product management team rather talked about this during the What's New presentation. Uh, and that is basically EUS releases are changing to now have Tor months of support. Uh, so what's the change here? And if we scroll down, we can see the a graphical representation. So historically, since uh, 4.8, I think, Johnny, 4.8 or 4.10, um, every, I think it was 4.8, every release mm -hmm. had 18 months of support. So US um, didn't really mean a lot, right? It was, you know, whether it was an even or an odd release, they all had 18 months of support. Uh, what EUS did mean is that you could do the accelerated updates. Uh, so we tested, we verified, and we supported a, an accelerated update from, say, 4.8 to 4.10 or 4.10 to 4.12. Um, and what that means is, so on, on the back end, what happens is we pause uh, updates or machine config pool rollouts to the compute nodes. Uh, we let the control plane update. So it goes from 4.8 to 4.9 to 4.10. Once it's on 4.10 and it's all happy and everything, uh, we unpause updates on those other machine config pools, and they go directly with one reboot from 4.8 to 4.10. Uh, so that was really the main benefit of using an EUS release for the EUS channel. Uh, now, uh, it is it, it, not only can you do those accelerated updates, but you can also get that additional support. So that uh, 24 months of support. And you'll see, I, I left it on this section here because of this particular sentence. So it does require a premium subscription to get the extra six months. But other than that, um, yeah, it's, it's except the U S channel. So awesome. I, yeah. I thought this was a good one. And this, uh, did we post this link into chat? Let me here post this link. Oh, you got it. All right. I got it. Got it. Yeah. It's a, it's a good blog post. Um, they walk through a bunch of different stuff, including kind of what I just talked about, which is like how the uh, EUS, yeah, here's how those accelerated updates work and stuff like that. Uh, one thing to note, if we look here, OpenShift 4.12, which is on 4.12.2 and stable. Um, so 4. Uh, uh, updates from 4.11 to 4.12 are not in the stable channel yet, which means they're also not in the EUS channel. Uh, so if you use the fast channel, you can update to 4.12 today, though. Uh, I think I had this open over here. I do. Uh, so this is just the update path tool. Um, I'll share the link here just in case anybody doesn't have it. Uh, so the update path tool is really handy because I can do things like I am currently on stable 4.11. And let's see, we'll say I'm on 4.11.27. And you see that there is a path to 4.12, any of the available releases. But if I switch over here to fast 4.11, and I'll go with the same 4.11.27, you see I have 4.12.3 and 4 as available with, with an update path. Um, and you can see it's just a direct update. So, or I should say, you have to change the uh, channel to fast 4.12. But fast channel, you can update today. Uh, fast is fully supported. Uh, so... If you have an issue during this update process, you can pick up and you can call us. You can get help for that. Um, it's only the candidate channels that are not supported. And I don't even think we put candidate channels in here, do we? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, historically, just for a reminder, so it usually takes um, somewhere between 45 and 60 days for upgrades to move from fast to stable. So upgrade from 4.11 to 4.12. Um, approximately 60 days after 4.2 goes GA is when it moves into the stable channel. Um, much like the stock market, you know, past performance does not indicate gains or anything like that. So it might not be 60 days. It could be, you know, 75 days. It could be 45 days. I, it's a window. Um, just be aware of that if you are uh, waiting on ups to 4.12. Uh, 
there were some other things I had up here. Oh, this is one of my clusters that I'm updating to uh, the latest 4.11. Um, so yeah, that was that was one of the big ones. I wanted to make sure to hit this and highlight this. Um, I know they talk, talked about it during the what's new, but uh, I, I always like to remind folks, I feel like of a, a quote unquote big deal because um, we had a number of customers who were asking about about this, right? It's it's hard to, even with an 18 month cycle, it's hard to keep up with that pace for some folks. So oh, yeah. this additional time for that, it also gives additional overlap between those EUS versions, you know, from... 10 to 12, there's, you know, some changes or eight to 10, you know, 4.9 was when we had some API removals like that. So going from eight to 10 means that, you know, maybe I need some extra time to do a full set of test and validation. Um, whereas previously it would have been, I think six months or something like that of overlap. Now it's a full year to give, uh, you know, those customers time to, to work through those issues. So, yeah, uh, let's see, I had something else in here too. What else did I have? And we got a question, Andrew. It was, um, is EUS available to all OpenShift Plus managed or only on-prem? Uh, also, is EUS channel available to everyone or does it need specific requirements to switch from stable channel? Um, so I believe, I don't think there is anything that restricts you from using the EUS channel. Um, so let me pick on one of my clusters here. Uh, oh, you just broke because you're in the process of upgrading. Uh, you can see here it's it's using the uh, uh, trial license or entitlement rather. So there's nothing that prevents me from going in here and selecting EUS for my channel. Um, you know, I can I can use that. N nothing is going to stop me. There is um, at this moment, and I, I believe that this is going to change in the future. But at this moment, there is nothing on the back end that controls or validates that. However, it is against, I guess, against the license agreements. Like you're, you're not in compliance if you don't have a premium subscription um, for either for any of the OpenShift entitlements. So it, whether using OKE, uh, OpenShift Container Platform, or OpenShift Platform Plus, um, as long as you have that premium subscription. The managed services, I think, are different. Um, I say that because the managed services, they have their own update cycle that is managed by those SRE teams. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, we as users and customers do have a, um, we do have some control over like when that happens, but they target or they only offer specific versions that we can update to uh, with each one of those. Um, we should, we, we can check on that. We can probably verify that with one of the managed open shift folks um, at some point. Yeah, please do an OC, get API request before you leap. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Um, R-Hope9, so if I do an OC, get API request counts, or I think I can just do API request count. If I use this particular uh, call, you can see as I scroll up here, there are three columns out here. The important one that we want to, that we care about, um, as we go through those different versions, is this removed and release. Uh, so as I scroll down here, you can see that right now, my cluster is using this flow schemas, V1, beta 1, flow control, blah, blah, blah. And it's removed on dot 26. So if whatever is using that, before I upgrade to Kubernetes 1.26, which will probably be OpenShift 4.13, uh, 4.12 is 1.25 base, so it would make sense for it to be 4.13. Um, I would want to make sure that whatever is using that is no longer using it. That being said, there's literally nothing in this cluster that is not a part of the default install. So, so this is something that Red Hat has deployed. You know, it's part of the cluster and managed, um, which means that it'll get taken care of automatically. But I can get confirmation and details on that um, by doing things like, so OC describe, API request count, and then provide it that name. And it gives me a bunch of information inside of here about what's actually using that. So I can say in the last 24 hours by node, here's the nodes that have been, you know, using this particular API. I don't even see none, all of these read zero. I have no idea where that 16 count came from. Uh, here we go by user. 
So Coop Storage version migrator service account. So basically I can track down, you know, where, where this is at um, and what it's doing, where the service account is being used, um, which appears to be this particular namespace. Um, figure out what that's doing and why it's doing it and kind of go from there. But like I said, this is a core, you know, OpenShift one. It's, it's managed by Red Hat. So we'll have that fixed before all that happens. But yeah, thank you for the reminder, our hope. Um, let's see. Uh, was that all that I had? Uh, no. You had one more about Node yeah. uh, machine config. Yeah, machine config. Um, so this one came up. Um, I was having a conversation with some internal folks. Uh, and what they were asking is, in particular, with, um, or not machine config, machine sets, in particular with vSphere, you know, I want to modify, say, the CPU or the memory associated with my nodes. Um, so this is an AWS cluster, but same principle kind of applies. Um, so with vSphere and IPI, or really anytime you're using a machine set, so you can use machine sets with UPI, by the way, um, you know, it, you set, you configure things like the amount of CPU, the amount of memory, the size of the disks, the network connections, all of those things inside of the machine set. Um, I could and should bring up the docs, so that way we can actually show that. Uh, so if I go to machine management and creating compute machine sets and there it is, vSphere. So I can scroll down here and you see this example. So here's the size of the disk that will assign to it. Here's the amount of memory that will assign, the number of CPUs, uh, the network devices. And you can't have more than one here, so it will connect to more than one network. Um, so you can basically shut down that node, do a cord and do a drain, shut down the, the node. Uh, the virtual machine, and you can adjust this, right? So after the VM has been deployed by the machine set, it's connected to the cluster, it's hosting workload, cord and drain, shut down, maybe change the memory to be 16 gigabytes. Turn it back on, it'll come back and rejoin the cluster and everything will be fine. There's technically nothing wrong with that. That'll behave exactly the way they want. The problem is now this configuration, the documented configuration, as much as you would consider the machine set to be the documented a of configuration is different than reality. So my personal opinion is that's not a, uh, not, not a desirable thing because it can lead to unexpected things. Um, similarly, I can go in on the machine set and I can change these values. Uh, so if I, I come back over here to my AWS cluster, I could go into this machine set and you know, edit it. And I can change this machine type or down here from like M6i extra large to like M6i double extra large. And I can save this. And from then on, any nodes, new nodes that are created by this machine set will use the new instance type. But it doesn't change anything about the existing nodes. So to use our uh, uh, vSphere on-prem vSphere instance, if I go into the machine set and I tell you, it doesn't affect the existing VMs that have been provisioned. It doesn't go back and retroactively apply that config. Uh, instead, any new nodes that are configured would have that new configuration. So again, we end up in this, in this uh, situation where the documented, the expected configuration is different than reality. Uh, technically, nothing wrong with that. Just as an administrator, it can be confusing. Uh, you know, I, I, used, I used the uh, example of you know, when I was a, a VMware administrator, I had dozens of vCenters, thousands of hosts. And when it's a small scale, you can have the scenario where, you know, yeah, one cluster has 12 hosts and six of them are this model with this much CPU and memory. And four of them are this model with this much CPU and memory. And two of them are this other model. And you have this, you know, uh, uh, heterogen heterogeneous um, hardware config. And it's okay. Yeah, it's small enough that you can remember different quirks and different things about it. But when you get to thousands of nodes, mm -hmm. uh, even dozens of nodes, um, it's hard. You, you start to forget all of the little nuances and all the little things. And especially especially in a disaster recovery or some type of scenario like that, um, you know, hey, this, this rack fell through the floor and, you know, now I need to recover all of these things. But, oh, wait, what about this config? They, like, it's just easier to be consistent and to have things um, behave the way that, that you expect them to. Um, I used to say that I did a, I did a demo of uh, OpenShift virtualization one time 
and I was, I was going through this whole thing and, and I'm talking about it and the, the person that I was demoing to, they, they said, this is kind of a, kind of a boring demo. Like, well, yeah, it's virtualization. Like you don't want it to be scary. Like you don't want it to like, you don't want to be surprised when it behaves the way you expect it to, which is create a virtual machine, turn it on and like live migrate and do this type of stuff. Like you want it to be boring. Like it's a core service. It's something that you, you know, your business depends on. Yeah. It's so, you know, I, I feel like, you know, this is one of those things that contributes to that, you know, consistent, predictable configuration um, that reflects reality, right. As documented. And I'm sure somewhere there's a GitOps person that is like screaming at their at their monitor saying, "Yes, yes, it should always reflect what that should." Be. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that, that's exactly what I was thinking. As like as you're talking about it, like, all right, I mean it makes sense, especially like when um, you know GitOps, right? Like this is what we this is what we want. So this is awesome. All right, I rambled on enough. Uh, you had a couple of things in the list here. Yeah, so mine are just like kind of like uh, updates. One is a. Um, um, one is that Red Hat has updated their certification policy. So if you are, um, um, if you're taking Red Hat certifications, or if if you've taken a Red Hat certification, uh, then you know like if you fail, then that's you're one and done, and it, that kind of it kind of stinks. And so Red Hat training has updated their policy for exam retakes. So if you uh, take an exam and you fail, then you get a free retake. Um, and I will post the link to the policy in just a second. Maybe here we go, and uh, this is kind of a big deal. I mean, it, it's awesome because like the the exams are expensive and they're hard, and um, so it, it kind of gives you that peace of mind that like you can go into it and maybe not have your best day, but then still have a chance to like, go back and get the cert again. Um, so I, I I'm glad that we finally did this. This is kind of in line with what the Linux Foundation is doing and with like uh, what a bunch of the other cert uh, providers are doing. So um, this is awesome. And then the other thing is that. Recently-ish, uh, there's a um, piece of Podman called Quadlet that was released or added to the um, product, and it's where it makes interacting with um, Podman containers as systemd units like it just simplifies that whole process. So um, this is a this is a really big deal, especially if you've ever used Podman and tried to use the systemd component. Um, it worked, but then sometimes it wouldn't, and sometimes it would be a little hacky. Um, this this is like the, the new version of that. And um, it, it allows you to manage these containers as, uh, as systemd units. And it's, it's pretty well integrated and it's uh, really nice. So check it out, post the link in the, uh, in the chat here. And those are my two things. Certifications. I should, I feel like I should get, go back and do some more certifications at some point. I should too, man. Like I, I need to, I did all mine at once when I first got here. And so a lot of mine are expired now. So it's like a, Need to go back and redo them. That's right, R09. <laughs> I'm posting the slides that uh, Sir Depot mentioned uh, because I realized that I, I think we asked Jamie to make sure that we could use them, and I downloaded them, and I think I, I my ADHD kicked in, and apparently I never actually posted them. So Oof. I'm doing that now. Right on. But yeah, so like, if you if you're interested in certs. You know, like I think now is probably the best time to like to get into it. Yeah, you know, and uh, especially now that you have like a the ability to do a scout run, as my friend Darren used to say. You know, you go in, go check it out, see what it's about, and then go back and focus on it. But I was trying to win the first time though, so don't you know? Don't listen. To... <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you to do that. I'm just saying. All right. There. Hopefully that link uh, will work for everyone uh, to get access to the slides. Deck not found. What do you mean deck not found? It's literally the link you gave me. Oh. Hold on a second. I actually have to click the, uh, let's see. There we go. I actually have to tell it to, you know, publish instead of me just uploading. Um, save. Okay, now it should work. All right, just uh, just to prove that it actually does work, let me turn back on my screen share. So, here, here's here's our slides from uh, so that that link does work now. All right. 
I swear I know what I'm doing and I've done this before. I know. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. It's Monday. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, no, it's not Monday. That's not okay. Like, <laughs> 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 somebody posted a thing internally that was like, you know, using the, uh, the golden ratio thing, you know, that, that swirly thing. Uh, using that to, you know, uh, uh, identify like the length of each day, like the relative length of each day. And, it, you know, it's like Monday is this huge block and then Tuesday's a little smaller until yep. it circles around and like Sunday's just this little blip. Uh, uh, let's see. Due to power outage, on NFS server restartable is used for bounded PVs with 4.10. Um, cordon evict reboot on cordon node by node. Yeah. Um, so for pods that have PVCs mounted, um, rescheduling them is harder until, because basically it doesn't know whether or not the PVC has been released from the other node. And it wants to have confirmation or it wants to have some kind of uh, uh, confidence that that has been released so it doesn't reschedule, restart the pod and then result in data corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, we encountered this with OpenShift virtualization, right? Um, you know, only one node at a time can access that uh, uh, VM's disk; otherwise, it'll corrupt. Um, so, yeah, it um, the fastest way to recover those, and this is what we see with the poison pill operator, uh, is to reboot the nodes. Um, and when, as soon as the node reboots, it says, oh, all of those PVCs are now released. Like I, I am comfortable. I can, I, I know that those are released and it'll go through and reschedule all of the workload again. Um, I think poison pill operator takes it a step further because um, it doesn't, there's not necessarily a fencing mechanism for all of the providers. So rather it just removes the node from the cluster, I think, and lets it rejoin. Um, is there any other way to fix this? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Aside from waiting for it to time out, um, you could probably delete the objects and have it recreate them. Um, but that's that. I don't think that that's a uh, necessarily a better way of doing that. Because um, essentially, so let's pick on um, anytime there's an HA event. So let's say the um, you know VMware. Uh, I have a node deployed in VMware and there is an HA event, the, the underlying ESXi host reboots or whatever, um, so or falls through the floor. Uh, so when the OpenShift node disappears, after five minutes, it will go into a unresponding or not responding status uh, with the scheduler. At that point, it will attempt to reschedule pods that don't have PVCs. Um, and then the ones with PVCs, there's another timeout that I'm not remembering off the top of my head, but it, eventually it will reschedule those pods. Um, but it's, it's a while. Uh, however, like in the case of VMware HA, it restarts the node within a few seconds and then the node comes back on and it says, Hey, I'm back. And here's all the pods that I have. And the scheduler says, but you're supposed to have all of these pods. So it immediately realizes that, oh no, all of this workload needs to be rescheduled. And you know things like the PVCs and all that have been unmounted, so it immediately goes through that process. Um, so let's say that uh, it, you're using like bare metal or something like that, you know, a physical server, and that server goes away. You know, it, it dual power supply failures, right? Something like that, where it's not coming back in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, the fastest way to get that workload back is to simply delete the node from the cluster. Um, uh, it, literally OC delete node and it'll kick that node out and it'll immediately reschedule all of that workload inside of there. Um, so again, not necessarily a fix so much as workarounds for that, that particular scenario. Um, okay. So yeah, keep, uh, keep, keep questions coming in. Uh, we appreciate those. Um, happy to do our best to answer them. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask Johnny in the interest of time, cause I do, uh, I do have a, I have to stop at a quarter after. Um, I'm going to ask Johnny if he's uh, ready to to demo some uh, security profile operator stuff. Yes. Um, All right. So I'll, I'll admit, SE Linux to me is like I have a I have a vague understanding of it, but uh, probably not as good as I should. I'm I'm with Christian Hernandez, and he like stop stop disabling SE Linux, like, <laughs> but but. 
anything that uh, involves policy modifications and all that, I got to go dig through docs and remember how all of it works. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've always been like pretty decent at like relabeling context and stuff like, or relabeling directories and stuff like that's, yeah. that's pretty much as deep as I've gone. You know, like when you add a new service and you want to like set up the directories or whatever um, and then adding ports and stuff like that. So I've never gone like super deep into it. Um, and like, I, I, I sent you a message before we started this day where it's like, this could probably be its own episode. Like there's just so much to it. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the SPO operator, the, the security profiles operator um, is basically like, it provides a way to define the secure computing, which is the SE comp. And I also didn't know this until yesterday is that SE comp is part of the BPF like umbrella, right? So you have mm -hmm. EPP, EPP, EBPF, which is the extended um, stuff, and SC comp kind of falls into that. And when it comes to like permissions, it's controlling the accesses that a uh, process can have within a container. And then SC Linux is controlling like the the accesses to like a, a file system or a service yeah. or an account and stuff like that. So just kind of like keeping those in mind. Um, and then with the SPO, we can distribute these SC comp profiles and SC Linux pro po policies profiles, whatever they are, um, as CRDs. And so um, it kind of, it's really nice. Like the, the SC Linux one that will show off. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, an SC Linux one, uh, just run, run it through the examples that are on their upstream docs. Um, but the, the SC Comp one, it's like, I'll show a profile that we have that like just kind of, it, it's essentially like the, uh, um, oh man, like the SC Alert stuff. You know, like back in the day, if you want to try and figure out like what's actually triggering an SC Linux context or whatever, um, then you can set up an alert where it'll essentially be noisy. And so um, uh, what will happen is like as a process is trying to make a call and it can't, then it'll log it. You know what I mean? So then you can go back and actually create the context or policy for it. Um, so let me go ahead and. Yeah. So I think the terse summary is security profile operator is for managing at the host level, the SE comp and SE Linux um, policies. Yep. Whereas, which, which also affect what pods are able to do, um, whether it's accessing like low level CPU instructions, file system type stuff, all of that. Um, yep. Uh, and I'm just going to put it paste these things really quick, just so I have it. Uh, so here's a blog that I was following that uh, was put out on, uh, blog.openshift.com. And then here is the upstream documentation. In just a second, bam. And they have some tutorials out there on their documentation. And so that's what I was kind of following along with. So that way I had, you know, a, a decent resource to use. Um, and so now let me go ahead and share my screen. Bam. I think we're fighting each other there. Uh, let's see. Let me turn mine off then. All right. Oh, yeah, my bad. All right. So um, over at Operator Hub, you just go through and um, you just install the special or the security profiles operator. And then what that'll do is that'll give you access uh, to the API to create an SC comp profile. If you wanted to do like an SC Linux profile, we could do that. And we can also do profile binding, which means that we can attach that profile, either an SC comp or a um, SC Linux profile to a pod. And so then that pod will have that restriction. And so if I go over and I just look at this SC comp profile that I've already created, and it's this SC comp profile one, it just essentially, um, it's adding this SCMP underscore act log. And what this this, this is essentially putting it in permissive mode or, or uh, in noisy mode, and so then um, you, as something is, you might need to you might need to make that bigger, oh, Johnny. Sorry, sorry. I mean, I know I'm looking at it on a smaller screen than normal, but yeah, let me. Did that actually help, or? Um, yeah, I think that's a little better. It, it's, you know, it's a pain trying to juggle all the different. Yeah. All right, well, if you can see it, I'm sorry, I apologize, but uh, it's under spec and then default action, and it's SCMP underscore act underscore log. And that's a that's a mode that um, essentially makes it noisy. So if um, a policy is trying to, to 
uh, or if a process is trying to do something that it's not allowed to do, it'll log that process. And then, um, you know, then you can go back and actually define the process that's more, uh, you know, geared towards what that process is trying to do. All right. And, and so I, I think, but that's the expected sort of um, me- method, right? Of a, you want to deploy something in your secure environment. And so you go in and the first thing is you deploy it and it's, it's failing miserably. So you turn on logging so you can see what's causing the issues and you can use those logs to then go in and, you know, craft the SE Linux policy or craft the uh, set comp um, profile and all of that other stuff. So that way you can get it back to working again. Yep. And, and Mira had asked, uh, what's a, what's the difference between an SE comp profile and an SEC and the, the answer is really like the SEC incorporates the SE comp profile and the uh, SE Linux profile. So it's like the restricted V2 is the, um, it's a, the culmination of like uh, the SE comp profile as well as the SE Linux profile. So they're, they don't allow certain processes. Like you can't have host access and um, uh, network access and stuff like that with the basic or with the default SEC. It's a, it's one of those defense in depth things, right? of like the SCC operates at the Kubernetes, um, not even the Kubernetes, it operates at the uh, uh, CRI level and then SecComp operates below that and SC Linux and it could, it creates this layer or the set of layers is what I understand. Yeah, and that's exactly it, right? Like if you you have to look at it as like a cake, right? So at, it's just a different boundary at the layer of a cake, you know, and as you're going up, you're getting yeah. more and more, uh, as you get, Closer to the top, you're less secure or more secure. And then, as you know, it's just it trickles yeah. down. Yeah, because I think it's it's technically possible, but I don't think it's supported to do things like disable SE Linux in CoreOS. But if you disable SE Linux, that doesn't mean that the SEC isn't still going to be there enforcing whatever policies it has. Mm-hmm. Um, so it very much becomes a defense in depth type of thing of if there's something that causes the SEC to fail, if there's something that, you know, on and on. And in OpenShift three, it would the install would fail if you had SC Linux disabled or even in permissive mode. So. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it, it set off all kinds of alarm bells and warnings and all kinds of stuff with OpenShift four as well. Yeah. I've I've seen the question asked internally a couple of times, like you know, oh my customer wants to turn off SC Linux, and consensus seems to be like one, no, um, two, definitely no, and three, <laughs> it might be possible, but no. Um, the answer so, is always no. Yeah. So yeah, we, we use SE Linux quite a bit. And we've talked about that before on the stream where there's been other CVEs that have affected Kubernetes that are, you know, largely mitigated out of the box because of SE Linux being turned on with OpenShift. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm, it's, it's the easiest thing to do to protect your system that like comes free. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's enforcing by default and um, almost every service that you have built in has a it has an SC Linux context associated with it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost at, especially at this point, like rel eight, rel nine, it's pretty transparent, you know, like back in the day of rel five, I could see where it was pretty painful, even rel six, but like these days, almost every service that we deploy has a, um, SC Linux context and profile associated with it. So it's, it's free, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the next thing, I think this is the one that most people are probably going to do is like the SC Linux profile. And uh, this is one that I created earlier, and it's just using Engin- Nginx, and we're just going through. And the cool thing about this is this is a YAML rep- representation of um, like of of this uh, uh, policy. But what happens is when, when the system interprets it, it actually turns it into like a CIL format. So then you can actually see like the SC Linux formatted language, you know, inside the inside the pod. So um, what we did is we're doing. Um, you know, we're, we're just giving some uh, Nginx configurations here. And then what I'm going to do, like, I messed up and I didn't install WebSSH standards, so I'm going to stop sharing this really quick. How, how dare you? I know, I know. And then I'm going to share this. Terminal. Bam. All right, so now if I do a RSH, so what I'm doing is I'm gonna, I've, I've applied that pod, or I've applied that SC Linux policy, and what that does is it gets uh, uh, installed into the daemon set for the security pod. And uh, 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to RSH into that pod. And then, oh, actually, I'm going to back out of this for just a second. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here. All right, so the default SC Linux is uh, the default SC Linux context for the pod is SPCT. So say we wanted to change this to something like unconfined, right? So then we could patch it. So I'm just going to do a real quick check on this. I got my notes all backwards here, so I'm kind of jumping around. Damn. All right, so let's do. Bam. Okay. Turn them off. All right, so now if I do a. So what I'm doing is I'm going to check inside of my uh, the OpenShift security profiles namespace, the daemon set S pod. And I'm going to look for the SPCT, which is, again, the default uh, uh, profile. So now if I do a patch and I want to patch this to unconfined, then what I'm doing is I'm essentially just I'm going to patch this, uh, this daemon set. And then we can see where um, it gets set for all the pods again. All right, so... All right, so now we can see that like now my, my default um, SC Linux context is unconfined T. And so that's just essentially saying that like there's no actual um, SC Linux context for that service, right? So it's just unconfined. And generally, if you're an HTTPD or like an SPC underscore T type context and you're trying to access something that's in unconfined, it generally won't work. So you'll have to go and either relabel or, um, you know, you're going to have to relabel, you know, or, or add some kind of a rule to allow it. Um, and then what we can do now is we can attach that policy to a pod. And so I'm just going to jump back over to the documentation. And I'm going to see if I can find this pod. All right. All right, let's see. So we'll do... Project. So now if I go to OC project demo. All right, bam. And what I'm going to do is this is the SE comp profile, or this is a deployment that I, I created earlier, and it's it's got a patch in it. And so if I look at this patch, essentially what I'm saying is, hey, look, I want to use this SE comp profile that got created. And just so we can see it, profile one. This is the profile that I created that was in the OpenShift console. So just so you know, it's, there's no like magic show craziness going on here. Um, and then this patch essentially just updates the, the deployment. And then um, what we can do is we can see where the, uh, the patch got applied. All right, and I'm gonna do this, bam. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm just taking a look at the uh, at the deployment SC comp demo, and then I'm just getting the security context out of that uh, out of that deployment. And so we can see now that my SC comp profile has been set to this profile one that I created earlier. So really, this is just going to again log all the all the um, noise, right? So that way, if we need to create an actual uh, policy for this, then we could. You know, and then apply it to our nodes and apply it to our uh, to a pod directly if we wanted to. And we can essentially do the same thing with the SC Linux context as well. Um, but I, Andrew, I, I really think that this is like something that we should probably do like a full uh, like a full episode on because like there's so much that we could do with it. And then when you take the whole story of security and OpenShift and then you know, like the, the file integrity operator and then all the other things, the, the compliance operator and all that stuff, right? It, it really builds into that whole story. So I'd, it's probably yeah. something we should do like a like an entire episode of like just security tools and stuff like that. 
Yeah, they um so we just added a uh, tech marketing person to focus on like the overall OpenShift security story and stuff like that. So I, I think in the uh, not too distant future we'll be able to have that uh, that type of conversation. Um, but yeah, there's also you know there's an entire product management team just for the security stuff. Um, yeah. a- ACS gets lumped in there too, but it's like all of the security features of OpenShift, Kubernetes you know, underlying rel, all of that stuff. Um, they, they focus on all of those things. So I feel like it's one of those things that also the uh, public sector folks can probably talk about. In, oh my gosh. Yeah. In ad nauseum. Oh yeah. Oh, did it. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Like there's without like going through like profile binding and stuff like that. Like it's just showing you that like we can create SC count profiles that, you know, make it, make it easy for us to create policies that we need to check out the blog because there's a lot of great information on there. Like the, the profile recording, which allows you to create policies, like especially in like the extreme sandboxing and stuff like that. Like there's, there's a lot of good information there. And um, yeah, I, I think like just a more in depth view and all this, but it uh, would be really awesome. But like the SC Linux stuff and the SC comp profiles are simple to create. And the, the idea is that you create it in YAML. It's a custom resource. So then you can ship it around. And then it translates it into a language that the system can understand, like that CIL format uh, for the SC Linux language. And uh, it's it's really awesome. Yeah, I need to ask if they're going to update the uh, the security white paper now that this stuff has been released. Um, just for, I'm looking at it now. It, it looks like it was last updated uh, September of 2021. Um, here, just for reference, for anybody who wants to see it. Um so I, I wonder if they'll update that now and add in, you know, there's been a bunch of stuff that's happened in the last uh, 18 months, basically, since that was published. So the, uh, um, gosh, file integrity operator, operator, the security profile operator, um, what's the other one where we're, uh, the compliance operator, like all of these things have had huge improvements or in the case of SPO been released. But yeah, that's all I got, man. I just wanted to kind of like show creating the profiles yeah. and then associating it to a pod and stuff like that. So, yeah, like I said, SE Linux in particular is mostly a black art to me. It, uh, it it's, oh, yeah. it's a mystery. I, I, I do, happy. I do it so infrequently. Well, it's funny because 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, let's see, when did I actually like professionally become a Linux administrator? So at least 15 years ago, you know, like, Back in the you know uh, rel three and four days, like y- you had to understand, like to be a, a a professional rel administrator, you had to have a fairly decent understanding of SE Linux oh, profiles yeah. and you know how to create them, how to manage them, and all that. Because there was just they haven't had the ensuing fifteen years to mature of you know all these workloads and all of this improvement from the community and like all of this stuff now where I don't even think about it anymore, like. May, maybe once a year will I encounter something where the SE Linux profile comes to mind. And honestly, I can't even, most of the time, it's when I want to do things like use HA proxy, use, you know, a, a NNFS or an SMB share, you know, something like that, where I have to go in and enable, you know, SE Linux to say, yes, I'll allow these, you know, these types of connections and that type of stuff. I don't remember the last time I touched an SE Linux policy, um, which is not to say there aren't people out there doing that. There's a lot of really really impressive applications and stuff like that, that people are putting on, you know, not just OpenShift, but RHEL, et cetera. So yes, there's absolutely cases where it happens. It's just for Andrew personally, it hasn't been, Yeah, it's been a minute. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I, like I said, I, I don't think I've ever actually written a policy, but definitely like I've used SC alert and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. I've relabeled context and stuff. I, I can, I can man the hell out of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's the important thing. I don't know where to go to find uh, to find more info. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the layered uh, la- uh, CoreOS layering. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to turn on my screen this time. Um, so this is that guy. So this is my OpenShift 4.12.2 cluster. Um, but really, what I want to show is the documentation. I find it. Come down here to 4.12, and I want varying. 
Arcos image ring. Uh, so the point of this feature is more or less to be able to allow as administrators the ability to add packages to CoreOS. And the way that this works is really, really interesting in that it is implemented as a container, which makes sense, right? Red Hat ships a base CoreOS image. Uh, and just like you have a from line in your container image file, it creates that copy on write layer on top. I can install packages on top of it and or add code or do whatever. And then at the end of that, I end up with this image that is deployed that is my containers. CoreOS works the exact same way. And in fact, image layering is a container image. Uh, so I start with my base CoreOS image. I can do an RPM OS tree install of packages uh, and then ship that out and basically have machine config operator apply it to our hosts. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm going to show here in a moment. And it's uh, it's frighteningly straightforward, uh, which is, again, not, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so a couple of things to note through here. Um, one, it is RPM OS tree, which means that we have to use the RPM OS tree tools and methodologies for managing that underlying file system, right? It's image-based. Uh, this is one of those really cool things about CoreOS, if you didn't know this. Um, so when we do things like updates um, with OpenShift with CoreOS, it applies the new image, it reboots it to flip over to that image, and assuming everything is good, it stays. If something goes wrong, it simply flips back to the old image uh, during that update process. So I, RPM OS tree is, is something that uh, has really been a powerful enabler inside of OpenShift and the whole management paradigm for the clusters. Uh, the other thing to note here is that this is a tech preview feature. Uh, so tech preview features mean a couple of important things. One, it's not supported. Uh, and two, using them in your cluster can cause your cluster to be unsupported as well. Um, so if this is something that like, you need right now, you want to use right now, uh, make sure that you work with Red Hat in order to understand that. Um, so for example, you don't have to um, go in and mark do the uh, tech preview no upgrades um, feature gate with this one in case you're not familiar with that. Um, so tech preview, no upgrade. So with some features that cause like low level configuration changes inside of OpenShift, you have to set this tech preview, no upgrade feature gate. Uh, and when you do that, a configuration change that'll result in all of the nodes rebooting. Uh, but it also enables a number of other features and functionality inside of the cluster. Uh, so we can see here, you know, CSI automatic migration for Azure and vSphere, uh, enabling swap memory on nodes. You can choose to enable these one at a time. They don't all automatically get enabled, by the way. Um, so down here, like C groups v2, you know, if you want to test out C groups v2, the important thing is the no upgrade set. Like one, once you set this, you can no longer upgrade your cluster. You can't go from, you know, if you set this on 4.12, you won't be able to go to 4.13. You'll have to reinstall the cluster and all that. So these are things you don't want to do with a production cluster. Uh, for this one, you don't have to set that um, uh, uh, feature gate, but I would say you still don't necessarily want to use it in a production cluster without, you know, guidance without out interacting with Red Hat and Red Hat support first. And I say that specifically because one of the first use cases that we have for this is applying hotfixes. Um, you know, customers, uh, this has been something that we've um, I would struggled with, but it's it's been a, something that has been concerning to customers for a while now, which is, you know, hey, I found this bug or hey, there's this security issue. And the way that we apply those is through an OpenShift update. Right. You, you have to wait for a Z stream. Once it, that Z stream makes it through, it gets applied and then you're good to go. Well, with this, we can basically say, you know, immediately, you know, yeah, RHEL has the fix, apply this package inside of your core OS using layering, you know, deploy it amongst your hosts and then you've got that fix. And in a week or two weeks or however long the relay cycle is for the next Z stream, when that gets applied, then yeah, you can go in and you can unset your, uh, your customized image and have it uh, reapply the, the base template with the new you know, updates. So you can kind of go in and out of this model as well. Um, what I mean by that is if I create my own customized template or a, a CoreOS image, I can apply that for a week or two weeks or a month or however long, and then I can remove it and go back to the default. Uh, where that changes or where you might not do that, um, that's the use case they have explained here with things like uh, uh, hotfixes 
is if you're needing to apply things like drivers. Um, I just saw somebody was asking about uh, like a brand new network adapter or something like that on one of the internal lists. And it's like, you know, yeah, the, the drivers just aren't available. Um, yeah, I hope not. Don't blame me. Send mail. Um, so when, if you are creating a custom image because you need to apply drivers for your hardware, because, you know, some hair is for some reason, for whatever reason, maybe your security team is insistent that you have some security agent that doesn't have a, uh, a containerized solution that you can manage in a Kubernetes native way, right? Those types of things. Um, then you ha- kind of have to do this ongoing support of core OS and the core OS image yourself. Uh, so the documentation walks through this. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hit it immediately in the docs, but it does talk about it on this page. Let me share this in the chat real quick. Um, so it does talk about on the page of effectively, if you create a customized image, you are now responsible for updating those nodes. So we go through here and in a moment I'll, I'll show creating a, uh, a machine config to then apply our customized image, apply this machine config will no or the machine config operator will no longer update those pools. It basically says you need to go in whenever, so let's say 4.12.3 gets released. You need to go in, you need to pull the new base image, you need to apply whatever packages against it, and then you need to go in and update your machine config um, in here to use that new image. At that point, it will regenerate the machine config for the pool, apply it against all of those. Uh, so it, it is not, these, are, these nodes are not updated uh, in the same way that the rest of the clear would be updated. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so let's switch over to my, my back over here. Let me know if they enough, Johnny. Uh, yep. Just adjust my window a little bit, make it a little easier. All right. So inside of here, pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm just going to apply, I'm going to pull a, uh, or apply a new patch against my uh, uh, CoreOS image. So there's a couple of things that we need, and I'm just now realizing that I took all of my notes and I did all of this on my laptop, and I'm not sitting at my laptop, I'm sitting at my desktop, which means that they are not synced. So we get to do it, uh, you all get to watch me do it live. Uh, let's see, image layering. So the first thing that we want to do as we come down through here is we want to determine which image we need to use for this. So the way that we do that is uh, OCADM. So OCADM release info dash dash image for blah, blah, blah. So let me copy this command out and switch back. And so what this is going to do is for my cluster, so you can see I'm running again 4.12.2. It's going to pull out the specific container image that it uses for this core OS. And this core OS would be expected to change with each Z stream associated with our cluster, right? Or most Z streams, I should say. After that, we need to go in and create a container file that sources or uses that as the base. So if I do a vim on my container file, See that I've already created one for us here. So if I oops, go here, I'm just going to paste it in to show you that this is the same image that I used before, right? So this is the one that I just determined from my cluster. So we can get rid of that line. So just like any other container from that CoreOS base image, I'm then going to copy in, in this case, my NUMA control package, the RPM for that. And then I'm going to run an RPM OS tree install. Now, if you look at the documentation over here, it focuses on the use case of, again, applying those uh, hot fixes and stuff like that, where we're not adding a package, we're replacing you know, some, some core package or some base package of OpenShift or of uh, CoreOS rather. So you can see the command that you use for that is going to be different. It's going to be an override replace as opposed to an install. Um, so I also, in my case, I went ahead and pulled the NUMA control package down and kept it locally simply because um, as I was prepping for this, I didn't want to have to worry about any kind of uh, registration or anything like that, trying to 
you know, pull from various repositories. I don't even know if it has repositories configured because remember our normally historically, this is not something that we would do. Um, you know, you, you don't SSH into the nodes and do an RPM OS tree install. Um, so I, I didn't test to see if any of that stuff is configured. I just went ahead and pulled the package locally and then added in and, uh, installed it locally. Uh, but yeah, other than that, pretty straightforward. So RPM OS tree install, it installs our package from the location that I copied it into right here, does a cleanup, and then does a commit against that particular image. Um, so remember, container image here is going to be um, from, so it's going to pull this image down. It'll create a new copy on write layer. It will add in our RPM. It'll create a new copy on write layer, and it'll run these particular commands against that. And then that becomes our new base image, which we will then push into a, a repository, a registry, and then we'll tell OpenShift in order in, in OpenShift to use that for our nodes. So with that out of the way, so here's my new control RPM. So to do a podman build uh, layered core OS. I think that's the name of my error book. Nope. Add those backwards. So all I'm doing is a standard container uh, build with Podman. So Podman builds tag the new builds with this tag and this version, and then build it in from this particular directory. Uh, you can see I already built this one, so it didn't go through the process. Actually, let me do a images. So that we can see the uh, build process here. So, in order to avoid the um, download, you can see it's a 2.86 gigabyte download. I won't delete this base image, but, but it would pull that down if it needed to. So with that, let's go ahead and do our build again. So from our base image, it's already pulled, so we don't need to wait on that. Copy in our RPM file. And then the next step is going to be an OS tree, RPOS tree install using that particular RPM file. I feel like I need to update the host or upgrade the host that's doing this because it's, it's okay. kind of slow. Uh, let's see, is using a custom core OS image and modifying default packages in the cluster supported by Red Hat? So at this moment, no. Uh, so it's a tech preview feature, um, which means that it is unsupported, but you're welcome to test it and you're welcome to use it um, for those things. Um, in the future, yes. However, what specifically is supported to be uh, modified or changed, I suspect will be controlled. Um, so I, I think they're taking a phased approach to this. So the first phase being things like applying hot fixes, stuff like that. Um, I think they'll also probably support things like drivers and all that being added in, um, but don't take my word for that because I'm speaking for the product management team at this point. Um, and I don't know if we would ever get to the point of allowing things like uh, HA proxy, like you know, doing an RPM OS tree install HA proxy, uh, because it would add a lot of um, potential conflicts um, that would be difficult to support. Um, HA proxy, you know, is going to listen on port 80 and 443, which is also where things like the ingress controllers listen, which means that there could be conflicts and, you know, it, it makes support hard. Um, so I, I would expect clarification as we get closer to um, GA, which I, I, again, without speaking for product management, which means uh, take it with a grain of salt. I, I, sus I, I hope we'll hit GA in 4.13, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait to see what, uh, what reality looks like there. Features can always get pulled, um, but it's hard to add them, if that makes sense. All right, so pretty straightforward here. Uh, if you've ever done RPM OS tree, this is the standard output. 
Um, after that, we do our commit into our layered image, right? Tagged it. And now I want to do a push. Uh, let's see. I think I need to log into Quay in order to do that, though. And Andrew, just to give you a time check, it's uh, seven after. All right, so now I can do a podman push, and we're going to push that image up. And now it's going to be for a minute, and now we're done. Uh, so now if I were to look in my Quay repository, um, what I see is those that, that container image having been pushed up and being available. Uh, so you don't have to use Quay for this. You can use, you know, whatever your normal internal registry is. Uh, I think over here in the docs, they use, yeah, see, example.com, which is just replace it with whatever yours is. Uh, so with, with that, so with our, our layered image now being available, it's been created, it's been pushed up into our registry. Um, now I need to actually tell OpenShift to use that. So let's copy this guy out and create it. So we have our machine config. I'm going to tell it to apply to any node that has the worker role. Uh, of course, you can be more granular with this as you would like. Uh, OS layer hotfix, we'll call this OS layer NUMA CTL. Um, and then I'm going to point this to my, my OS image URL. So one thing to note here, they are using the SHA-256 sum. Um, I, kind of like that approach and it's relatively easy to get those from Quay um, as well. So if we do Quay.io and oh I didn't even know that this was a login. Well that's interesting. Uh, anyways if I go here I don't have any registries. Do I have any over here? Nope. Okay. So come on. So I'm just gonna choose one of these at random. And I can go to the tags and I can select one of these. So if I click this fetch tag here, come on, oops. I'm being impatient and it's working against me. Come on, buddy. There it is. So in this modal, I can select podman pull by digest, and you see it spits out this value here, and it has that SHA digest at the end of it. Uh, so I'm going to do literally that exact same thing just against my uh, my image over here um, where I'm logged into my Quay as opposed to logged into, well, I'm logged into Quay, but not the Quay that I just pushed it to. So we'll copy that guy out. We'll close that guy and that guy. And now we paste into here. Again, super simple, super straightforward machine config. We'll go ahead and create that. Come down to my machine configs. Down here we have our OS layer Numa control. I can go to my MCP and you can see that now the worker one has been re-rendered and now my nodes are updating. So if I click on this, what we should see is it go through and do what it needs to do. Yeah, an available count is one because it's going to apply those one at a time because the default max unavailable is one. Uh, so now it's just, you know, we, we wait. It'll take it a few minutes. It'll go through. Um, it will apply the new image, it will reboot the nodes, or it'll cordon drain, apply the new image, reboot the nodes, they should come back, they should now have our customized image available to them. So very straightforward in that respect. That is awesome. Yeah, it's, um, it, it was so funny to me the first time that the product management engineering team, I, I talked with them, as, uh, with them about this, it was one of those just, uh, epiphanies of clarity of 
like oh of like of course we can use a container image for rpm os tree it's just mm-hmm. layers it's just it, it's just like a container like this makes perfect sense um and i i think so even though it is applied as a or managed as a container image a core os itself isn't running as a container image right it, it mm-hmm. uses it, it does an rpm os tree uh upgrade no um Gosh, now I'm forgetting the command. It basically copies that entire image out. So we don't suffer from things like the copy on right layer penalties or anything like that at the right. base OS image level. Um, but yeah. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. I'm, uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to this because it, it enables some, um, you know, particularly for edge devices and stuff like that, where we end up with, um, shall we say, uncommon hardware combinations. <laughs> it, <laughs> It, it has, it, this makes it easy to add things like drivers and other stuff that we need at those nodes without going through the process of, okay, how do I create a privileged container that has a, a kernel module and have it mm-hmm. get instantiate? Like, it's a complex process that this is just dramatically simpler. Oh, um, yeah. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's all I got. I said my, my mine was way easier. I didn't I didn't mean like when we were talking about it yesterday. I didn't mean for you to volunteer to take the more complex one. <laughs> oh no no no! It, it's like and I was sitting there thinking. I was like, well, how much? I didn't I didn't realize how much there was to it, you know. And then until I started like, digging in, I'm like, oh my god, there's just there's so yeah. much, and it, it 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 goes into the whole story, which I get right, and I think that's where like just I can show you profiles and stuff like that, but like it, it's something that we need to like show like a full scale kind of. Here's, here's how it all works together and here's why it matters kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I assume we cannot create a conf- for the control play nodes. Um, actually, I don't know. I, I would I would assume you can. Um, but that's a good question. Well, I'll, I'll ask the product management team about that, um, whether or not that's on the uh, plan to be supported, et cetera. Because in my mind, uh, you know, again, if we're talking about something like drivers, it makes sense that, you know, at an edge, no, at an edge deployment or something like that, you're probably going to be using something like single node OpenShift or uh, uh, a, a compact cluster, right? A three node mm-hmm. cluster, where you know the the nodes, the worker nodes, are control plane nodes. Um, so things like that are going to be it's going to be important to be able to apply these and manage these with those control plane nodes as well. And I don't. I, that's an interesting question. I wonder if things like kubelet are managed through RPM OS tree. I don't think they are, but I don't know. Cause that could cause complications if there's mismatches, but I think that there's enough flexibility in Kubernetes where Kubernetes can be, you know, here, let's, let's look at this, you know, uh, OC version. So, you know, here Kubernetes is 125.4. I think there's enough flexibility that you know, the cluster can be Kubernetes 1.25.4, but the nodes can be using kubelet from 1.25.3, you know, which is the type of change I would expect to see in like a, uh, a Zstream update where we're having to do that. So I update the cluster, uh, you know, I, I go in through here and I update the cluster and it updates OpenShift in Kubernetes, but not the, uns- and then I go in and I update the core OS and it can be done in conjunction. I don't think there are any strong ties to those um, or, or rigid, I should say. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for everyone or thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, like I said, I do have a relatively uh, hard stop here at about a quarter after. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit those in and we'll do our best to answer them while I ramble through the closing here. Um, if you have anything, if anything occurs to you after the stream, if you, or, or if you're not watching us live, uh, and you want to send us questions again, you can reach out to us, uh, at andrew.sullivan at redhat.com or johnny, J-O-N-N-Y at, at redhat.com. Uh, for Red Hat folks, you know, Johnny and I are on all of the platforms and all of the things you can reach out to us, um, on any of those internal platforms, except IRC. I am not on IRC. Um, I don't know if you are Johnny. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, and then for anybody and everyone, including Red Hat folks, IBM folks, uh, you know, customers, partners, anyone who wants to chat with us, um, I always recommend the Kubernetes Slack. 
Uh, so the Kubernetes Slack, and Johnny, I don't know if you have your link handy. Uh, the Kubernetes Slack has a uh, OpenShift users channel uh, that you can reach out and ask questions and interact with the community. It's something like 4,000 strong or 4,500 strong now. Uh, you can also ping Johnny and I um, you know, through DMs and stuff like that on there as well. So I think I am uh, just like my Red Hat username, Ann Sullivan on that one, if I remember correctly. Uh, let me look. I just show up as Andrew Sullivan. So, and yeah, Johnny, you're J Rock, I think. On J Rock, yeah, J Rock TX. Yeah, I don't know. How'd it be complicated? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we love to hear from you all. We love to get messages. We love to get emails with questions, suggestions. Um, we just had somebody suggest something yesterday. What was it, Johnny? Um, uh, there, it was security. Something was security. Uh, I don't remember, but I, I was going to respond back to it. Like, yes, we're, we'll we'll do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, and we're also hoping to have a number of other topics coming up. So um, not just around 4.12, but around other features, other capabilities in OpenShift, as well as uh, we started talking to some partners about bringing some partners on. So um, I would definitely suggest, if you have not already, to subscribe to whatever channel you're watching us on. Um, you know, maybe set up an email filter or something like that if you don't want to get a, an alert or anything like that every time, you know, Red Hat or OpenShift posted a video to the channel. Um, but yeah, we, we would love to have you all. And of course, you can go to uh, the streaming calendar as well. Um, and that's at uh, redhat.com or red.ht um, slash streaming. I'll post that in the chat here. Clear security scanner. Claire, yeah, that's right. With uh, with Quay or yeah. Key, uh, you know, we, we, we were just, I, I was just in, uh, I was just in Ireland and and uh, Singapore that both use closer to the British English, so Key, you know, not not the Americanized Quay. All right, sir. Monster. Yeah, yeah. I will uh, <laughs> maybe see you next week. Um, I know you said you had something that might overlap, um, and in person things are important, so. Uh, if not, I will be here next week for sure. Um, I think somebody mentioned the uh, agent-based installer, which is what I was considering doing for next week's topic. Um, and hopefully Johnny can join us for that. So uh, yeah. best way to expose a service to a public IP address uh, via Metal IB, uh, Metal LB. Um, so Metal LB, you assign it a pool of IPs that it can use. Um, and you can, you can either allow it to auto-select from that pool or you can manually assign it an IP from that pool. So if those are publicly exposed IPs already, then you're kind of good to go. Uh, if not, you can you know, set up firewall rules or, or a, a, another external load balancer to direct that traffic through and connect them together. That would be my suggestion. But yep. um, yeah, Metal LB is straightforward. We did a uh, stream on Metal LB as well. Um, I don't know if I can find that one here in the last couple of seconds. You're usually you're always really good at finding those things, Johnny. I'm, I'm like I'm digging in right now. I don't know how you find them so quick. The Google is strong. Right, here, I got it. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so in that stream, we walked through uh, Metal LB, um, L2 Metal LB, not L3 Metal LB. So not the. Um, uh, or no, we did. I did both, didn't I? Yeah, I'm gonna post both of them right okay. now. Okay. Bam. Yeah, there was one L2. where I there was one where I did uh, the the it was it OSPF I don't remember. In M State. In M State. Yep. All right. That's, All right. The the first link is uh, the uh, L two, and then the second one is L three. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this week. Uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out and uh, Johnny. Any uh, any last words from you? I oh, man, hey, thanks again for uh, you know being here and being awesome. And uh, yeah, see you next week. Bye now.